Welcome to the High Roads Media presentation of the motivational classic, Think and Grow Rich, the 21st Century Edition, written by Napoleon Hill. This is a verbatim reading of the new, updated version of the world's best-selling success book, edited and annotated by Bill Hartley and Ann Hartley, and read by Michael McConaughey. The Secret of Success In every chapter of this book, mention is made of the money-making secret that has made fortunes for the exceedingly wealthy men whom I have carefully analyzed over a long period of years. The secret was first brought to my attention by Andrew Carnegie. The canny, lovable old Scotsman carelessly tossed it into my mind when I was but a boy. Then he sat back in his chair with a merry twinkle in his eye and watched carefully to see if I had brains enough to understand the full significance of what he'd said to me. When he saw that I had grasped the idea, he asked if I would be willing to spend twenty years or more preparing myself to take it to the world, to men and women who, without the secret, might go through life as failures. I said I would, and with Mr. Carnegie's cooperation, I have kept my promise. Editor's Comments in 1908, during a particularly downtime in the U.S. economy and with no money and no work, Napoleon Hill took a job as a writer for Bob Taylor's magazine. He was hired to write success stories about famous men. Although it would not provide much in the way of income, it offered Hill the opportunity to meet and profile the giants of industry and business, the first of whom was the creator of America's steel industry, multimillionaire Andrew Carnegie, who was to become Hill's mentor. Carnegie was so impressed by Hill's perceptive mind that following their three-hour interview, he invited Hill to spend the weekend at his estate so they could continue the discussion. During the course of the next two days, Carnegie told Hill that he believed any person could achieve greatness if they understood the philosophy of success and the steps required to achieve it. It's a shame, he said that each new generation must find the way to success by trial and error when the principles are really clear-cut. Carnegie went on to explain his theory that his knowledge could be gained by interviewing those who had achieved greatness and then compiling the information and research into a comprehensive set of principles. He believed that it would take at least 20 years and that the result would be the world's first philosophy of individual achievement. He offered Hill the challenge, for no more compensation than that Carnegie would make the necessary introductions and cover travel expenses. It took Hill 29 seconds to accept Carnegie's proposal. Carnegie told him afterward that had it taken him more than 60 seconds to make the decision, he would have withdrawn the offer, for a man who cannot reach a decision promptly, once he has all the necessary facts, cannot be depended upon to carry through any decision he may make. It was through Hill's unwavering dedication that this book was eventually written. For detailed information on the life of Hill, read or listen to the audiobook of A Lifetime of Riches, The Biography of Napoleon Hill by Michael J. Ritt, Jr. and Kurt Landers. Michael Ritt worked as Hill's assistant for ten years and was the first employee of the Napoleon Hill Foundation where he served as executive director, secretary, and treasurer. The material in his book comes from his own personal knowledge of Hill, as well as from Hill's unpublished autobiography. That is the end of the editor's comment. This book, Think and Grow Rich, contains the Carnegie Secret, a secret that has been tested by thousands, now millions of people in almost every walk of life. It was Mr. Carnegie's idea that the magic formula, which gave him a stupendous fortune, ought to be placed within reach of people who do not have the time to investigate how others had made their money. It was his hope that I might test and demonstrate the soundness of the formula through the experience of men and women in every calling. He believed the formula should be taught in all public schools and colleges. He said that if it were properly taught, it would revolutionize the entire educational system and the time spent in school could be reduced to less than half. In Chapter 4, On Faith, you will read the astounding story of the organization of the giant United States Steel Corporation, 
It was conceived and carried out by one of the young men through whom Mr. Carnegie proved that his formula will work for all, for all who are ready for it. This single application of the secret, by Charles M. Schwab, made him a huge fortune in both money and opportunity. Roughly speaking, this particular application of the formula was worth $600 million. These facts give you a fair idea of what reading this book may bring to you, provided you know what it is that you want. Editor's Comment According to one method of calculation, through inflation alone, it would take approximately $20 in 2001 to buy what $1 would have bought in 1901. However, to find the contemporary equivalent value of $600 million is not simply a matter of multiplying by the increase in the cost of living. Although there are other factors and variables in calculating buying power, even by conservative estimates, the $600 million would translate into at least $12 billion at the beginning of the 21st century. That's the end of the editor's comment. The secret was passed on to thousands of men and women who have used it for their personal benefit. Some have made fortunes with it. Others have used it successfully in creating harmony in their homes. A clergyman used it so effectively that it brought him an income of upwards of $75,000 a year, approximately $1.5 million in contemporary terms. Arthur Nash a Cincinnati tailor used his near-bankrupt business as a guinea pig on which to test the formula. The business came to life and made a fortune for its owners. The experiment was so unique that newspapers and magazines gave it millions of dollars' worth of publicity. The secret was passed on to Stuart Austin Weir of Dallas, Texas. He was ready for it, so ready that he gave up his profession and studied law. Did he succeed? You'll read the answer in Chapter 6. Specialized knowledge. as knowledge. While I was the advertising manager of the LaSalle Extension University, I had the privilege of seeing J.G. Chaplin, president of the university, use the formula so effectively that he made LaSalle one of the great extension schools of this country. The secret is mentioned no fewer than a hundred times throughout this book. It has not been directly named, for it seems to work more successfully when it is merely left in sight where those who are ready and searching for it may pick it up. That is why Andrew Carnegie passed it to me without giving me its specific name. If you are ready to put it to use, you will recognize this secret at least once in every chapter, but you will not find an explanation of how you will know if you are ready. That would deprive you of much of the benefit you will receive when you make the discovery in your own way. If you have ever been discouraged, if you have had difficulties that the very soul out of you, if you have tried and failed, if you were ever handicapped by illness or physical affliction, the story of my own son's discovery and use of the Carnegie formula may prove to be the oasis in the desert of lost hope for which you have been searching. This secret was extensively used by President Woodrow Wilson during the World War and by President Roosevelt during the Second World War. It was passed on to every soldier in the training received before going to the front. President Wilson told me it was a powerful factor in raising the funds needed for the war. A peculiar thing about this secret is that those who acquire and use it find themselves literally swept on to success. However, as is often pointed out in this book, there is no such thing as something for nothing. The secret cannot be had without paying a price although the price is far less than its value. Another peculiarity is that the secret cannot be given away, and it cannot be purchased for money. Unless you are intentionally searching for the secret, you cannot have it at any price. That is because the secret comes in two parts, and in order for you to get it, one of those parts must, al must already be in your possession. The secret will work for anyone who is ready for it. Education has nothing to do with it. Long before I was born, the secret had found its way into the possession of Thomas A. Edison, and he used it so intelligently that he became the world's leading inventor, although he had only three months of schooling. The secret was passed on to Edwin C. Barnes, a business associate of Mr. Edison's. He used it so effectively that he accumulated a great fortune and retired from active business while still a young man. 
you will find his story at the beginning of the next chapter. It should convince you that riches are not beyond your reach, and that no matter where you are in life, you can still be what you wish to be. Money, fame, recognition, and happiness can be had by you if you are ready and determined to have these blessings. How do I know these things? You should have, should have the answer before you finish this book. You may find it in the very first chapter or on the last page. While I was doing the research that I had undertaken at Andrew Carnegie's request, I analyzed hundreds of well-known men. Many of them attributed the accumulation of their vast fortunes to the Carnegie secret. Among these men were Henry Ford, founder of the Ford Automobile Company. Ford started with no money and little education, yet became one of the most successful self-made businessmen in American history. William Wrigley, Jr., a traveling salesman who found that his customers liked the chewing gum he gave away as a premium better than the goods he sold, so he started his own company. John Wanamaker, known as the Merchant Prince, he created the world's first department store and was hailed for his innovations in marketing, customer service, and employee benefits. James J. Hill Known as the Empire Builder, he built the transcontinental Great Northern Railway, encouraged homesteading in the West, then established shipping routes linking America to Asia. George S. Parker a schoolteacher who grew tired of fixing his students' pens, he created a new design, founded the Parker Pen Company, and turned a simple idea into a fortune. E.M. Statler The son of a poor pastor, he started as a bellboy and worked his way up until he was able to start his own chain of Statler hotels, famous for their luxury and service with a smile. Henry L. Doherty Started at age 12 as an office boy for Columbia Gas, he went on to acquire 53 utilities companies and patented 140 innovations for natural gas and oil production. Cyrus H. K. Curtis Starting with a small agricultural weekly, Curtis turned it into Ladies' Home Journal, created Saturday Evening Post, then assembled one of the largest newspaper empires. George Eastman Inventor and founder of the Eastman Kodak Company, he created many of the innovations that popularized photography and transformed the motion picture industry. Charles M. Schwab The right-hand man of Andrew Carnegie, he was president of Carnegie Steel Company, brokered the deal that formed U.S. Steel, and went on to found Bethlehem Steel. Theodore Roosevelt 26th President of the United States from 1901 to 1909 John W. Davis, a lawyer and political leader, Davis was Solicitor General under President Woodrow Wilson and later appointed Ambassador to Great Britain. Albert Hubbard, philosopher, publisher of the Fra magazine and founder of the Roy Crofter's Artist Colony, Hubbard was also the author of many bestsellers including A Message to Garcia. Wilbur Wright, a bicycle shop owner who, with his brother Orville, became the first Americans to fly heavier-than-air aircraft and pioneered the aviation industry. William Jennings Bryan, newspaper publisher, presidential nominee, Secretary of State under President William McKinley, but perhaps best known as the lawyer who defended creationism at the Scopes Monkey Trial. Dr. David Starr Jordan, educator, scientist, Author of over 50 books, he was the nation's youngest university president at Indiana University and became the first president of Stanford University. J. Ogden Armour Inherited his family's meatpacking business, turned it into a conglomerate with more than 3,000 products, was an owner of the Chicago Cubs, and a director of National City Bank and American International Corporation. Arthur Brisbane a crusading journalist and syndicated columnist, Brisbane was sought after by every major news organization and was the most read and highest paid editorial writer of his day. Dr. Frank Gonzalez, a Chicago preacher who delivered such a powerful sermon, Philip D. Armour gave him a million dollars to start the Armour Institute of Technology, of which he became president. Daniel Willard, 
president of the B&O Railroad for more than 30 years, he was honored by having the city of Willard, Ohio, named for him. King Gillette A traveling salesman and born tinkerer, Gillette was trying to shave on a moving train when he came up with the idea of the safety razor, which became the foundation of a corporate giant. Ralph A. Weeks President of International Correspondence Schools, Weeks helped finance Napoleon Hill's Intrawall Institute, established to educate and rehabilitate prison inmates. Judge Daniel T. Wright, instructor at Georgetown Law School, where Napoleon Hill was studying when Bob Taylor's magazine gave him the assignment to write a profile of Andrew Carnegie. John D. Rockefeller. With $1,000 in savings plus another $1,000 borrowed from his father, he started a kerosene company which he grew into the giant Standard Oil and one of the world's greatest fortunes. Thomas A. Edison, inventor and entrepreneur, he perfected the electric light bulb, the phonograph, the motion picture camera, and owned the rights to more than 1,000 patented inventions. Frank A. Vanderlip, a poor boy who became a journalist, social reformer, and self-made millionaire, he was president of the National City Bank, now Citibank, and assistant secretary of the Treasury. F. W. Woolworth, a clerk in a general store, he pioneered the idea of fixed price selling and self-service and forever changed retail selling with a chain of Woolworth 5 and 10 cent stores. Colonel Robert A. Dollar, a dollar. Starting with a small schooner bought to haul lumber down the West Coast, he built the Dollar Steamship Company, the largest fleet of luxury liners sailing under the U.S. flag. Edward A. Filene, founder of the Boston-based stores, he devised revolutionary methods of distribution and merchandising and became famous for the first bargain basement department. Edwin C. Barnes, the only man Thomas Edison ever had as a partner, Barnes took Edison's failing dictaphone and sold it so successfully it became a fixture in offices and made him a multimillionaire. Arthur Nash, a Cincinnati tailor who used his bankrupt business as a guinea pig for the Carnegie secret and was so successful the newspapers made him famous as Golden Rule Nash. Clarence Darrow, famed as a lawyer, public speaker, and defender of the underdog, Darrow is best known as teaching the theory of evolution at the Scopes Monkey Trial. Woodrow Wilson, 28th President of the United States of America from 1913 to 1921. William Howard Taft, 27th President of the United States of America from 1909 to 1913. Luther Burbank, world-renowned horticulturalist who introduced over 800 varieties of new plants in his effort to improve the quality of plants and thereby increase the world's food supply. Edward W. Buck. Although he had only six years schooling, by the age of 20 he was editor of Ladies Home Journal, which he helped to build into the world's most widely circulated magazine. Frank A. Munsey. A telegraph operator who quit to launch Argosy magazine, then parlayed his fortune into a newspaper empire that included the Washington Times and the Washington Times and the New York Herald. Albert H. Gary, chairman of U.S. Steel, at the time the largest corporation in the world, Gary spearheaded the construction of its first major project, the Gary Work Steel Plant and the city of Gary, Indiana. Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, best known as the inventor of the telephone, Bell also perfected recording devices, advances in aircraft, and was a co-founder of the National Geographic Society. John H. Patterson, president of National Cash Register, Patterson was known as an advertising visionary and a genius at motivating his sales force, which made NCR the leader in its field. Julius Rosenwald, a small manufacturer who foresaw the future of mail order he bought 25% of Sears Roebuck and Company, and together with Richard Sears, built it into an icon of American business. Stuart Austin Weir, a construction engineer Hill met in the Texas oil fields, who, inspired by the Carnegie secret, 
went to law school after age 40, and also helped publish Napoleon Hill's magazine. Dr. Frank Crane, a noted psychologist, essayist, and author of the book Four Minute Essays on subjects such as The Price of Liberty, Pragmatism, The Duty of the Rich, and How to Keep Friends. J.G. Chaplin, president of the LaSalle Extension University at the time Napoleon Hill worked in the university's advertising and sales department, where he first realized his talent for motivating people. Jennings Randolph, a congressman, then U.S. Senator from West Virginia. Randolph was a lifelong admirer of Napoleon Hill, and it was he who encouraged Hill to act as advisor to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. These names represent a small fraction of well-known Americans whose achievements, financial and otherwise, prove that those who understand and apply the Carnegie secret reach high positions in life. Editor's Comment As Napoleon Hill says, the preceding list includes only some of the more than 500 multimillionaires and extraordinarily successful individuals whom Napoleon Hill interviewed prior to writing Think and Grow Rich. It does not include the equally impressive list of people he came in contact with after the publication, nor does it include the names of those who did not have the opportunity to meet Napoleon Hill personally, but who attribute their success to having read this book. It is said that Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich have made more millionaires than any other person in history. It might equally well be said that Napoleon Hill inspired more motivational experts than any other man in history. It is practically impossible to find a motivational speaker who does not draw upon Hill's work. His influence can be seen in the writings of his early peers, Dale Carnegie and Norman Vincent Peale. Later, successful authors and speakers such as W. Clement Stone, Og Mandino, and Earl Nightingale either worked directly with Napoleon Hill or with the Napoleon Hill Foundation. Echoes of Hill's principles can also be found in books by people as diverse as Wally Famous Amos, Mary Kay Ash, Ken Blanchard, Adelaide Bry. Chicken Soup for the Soul authors Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen, Debbie Fields, Shakti Gawain, John Gray, Susan Jeffers, Bruce Jenner, Charlie Tremendous Jones, Tommy Lasorda, Art Linkletter, Joan London, Dr. Maxwell Maltz, James Redfield, Dr. Bernie Siegel, Jose Silva, Brian Tracy, Lillian Vernon, and Dennis Waitley. Stephen Covey, author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, has often spoken of the influence of Napoleon Hill. Anthony Robbins, arguably the most successful motivational author and speaker at the beginning of the 21st century, has acknowledged Napoleon Hill as a personal hero. That is the end of the editor's comment. I have never known anyone who was inspired to use the Carnegie secret who did not achieve noteworthy success. On the other hand, I have never known anyone to distinguish themselves or to accumulate riches of any consequence without possession of the secret. From these two facts, I draw the conclusion that the secret is more important for self-determination than anything you receive through what is popularly known as education. Somewhere, as you read, the secret will jump from the page and stand boldly before you, if you are ready for it. When it appears you will recognize it. Whether you receive the sign in the first chapter or the last, stop for a moment when it presents itself and make a note of the time and place. You will want to remember because it will mark the most important turning point of your life. Remember, too, as you go through the book, that it deals with facts and not with fiction. Its purpose is to convey a great universal truth through which you, if you are ready, may learn what to do and how to do it. You will also receive the needed stimulus to make a start. As a final word of preparation, may I offer one brief suggestion which may provide a clue how the Carnegie secret may be recognized? It is this. Achievement and all earned riches have their beginning in an idea. If you are ready for the secret, you already possess one half of it. Therefore, you will recognize the other half the moment it reaches your mind. Editor's Comments 
Unlike much of the business and motivational literature available, Think and Grow Rich is not written for readers to skip around from chapter to chapter, taking a concept here and an idea there to solve the problem of the moment. This book is written as a carefully integrated whole, to be read in its entirety, from beginning to end. Concepts that are introduced in one chapter recur in other chapters where their meaning and significance rely upon the reader having already assimilated the earlier knowledge. The chapters are designed to build upon one another in such a way that every word is to be read, every idea is to be considered, and every concept is to be understood and absorbed. Think and Grow Rich is often called the first philosophy of personal achievement and a philosophy is more than a collection of solutions to business problems. A philosophy is a system of principles that will guide your thoughts and actions and provide you with a code of X and a standard of values. Think and Grow Rich will not just change what you think, it will literally change the way you think. In preparing this new and updated edition, Every aspect of Think and Grow Rich has been analyzed to ensure its relevance to the current business climate. In those instances where material might be considered dated or out of step with contemporary practices, the original text has been updated or augmented with relevant new material. A hallmark of the original edition of Think and Grow Rich is that in every chapter Napoleon Hill cites real-life examples based on his own first-hand knowledge of America's most successful self-made multimillionaires. In this edition, every one of Hill's stories has been retained, and the editors have added contemporary examples and modern parallels, which clearly demonstrate that Hill's principles are as up-to-date as, to as today, and still guiding those who succeed. In addition to contemporary examples, where the editors felt it would be of interest to the reader, we have included marginal notes that provide relevant information about recent developments. Where applicable, we have also suggested books or other materials that complement various aspects of Napoleon Hill's philosophy. On a more technical note, the editors have approached the written text as we would that of a living author. When we encountered what modern grammarians would consider run-on sentences, outdated punctuation, or other matters of form, we opted for contemporary usage. Those readers familiar with earlier editions will note that the chapter numbers have been changed in this edition. Originally, Think and Grow Rich began with an unnumbered chapter, a word from the author. In this edition, that text appears as Chapter 1, and is, is renamed The Secret of Success. The chapters that follow are renumbered sequentially and proceed in their original order. The chapter that was previously titled The Mystery of Sex Transmutation has been retitled Sexuality, Charisma and Creativity, and the text has been restructured and annotated to reflect the role of women in contemporary society. All editorial commentary is clearly set off in a font and style that is different from the original text. This is the end of the editor's comments. Both poverty and riches are the offspring of thought. Chapter 2 Thoughts are Things The man who thought his way into partnership with Thomas A. Edison Truly, thoughts are things, and powerful things, when they are mixed with definiteness of purpose, persistence, and a burning desire for their translation into riches or other material objects. Some years ago, Edwin C. Barnes discovered how true it is that you really can think and grow rich. His discovery did not come about at one sitting. It came little by little, beginning with a burning desire to become a business associate of the great Thomas Edison. One of the chief characteristics of Barnes' desire was that it was definite. He wanted to work with Edison, not for him. Pay close attention to the story of how he turned, he turned his desire into reality, and you will have a better understanding of the principles that lead to riches. When this desire, or this thought, first flashed into his mind, he was in no position to act upon it. Two problems stood in his way. He did not know Mr. Edison and he did not have enough money to buy a train ticket to West Orange, New Jersey, where the famed Edison Laboratory was located. 
These problems would have discouraged the majority of people from making any attempt to carry out the desire. But his was no ordinary desire. The Inventor and the Tramp Edwin C. Barnes presented himself at Mr. Edison's laboratory and announced that he had come to go into business with the inventor. Years later, in speaking about that first meeting, Mr. Edison said about Barnes, He stood there before me looking like an ordinary tramp, but there was something in the expression of his face with the impression that he was determined to get what he had come after. I had learned from years of experience with men that when a man really desires a thing so deeply that he is willing to stake his entire future on a single turn of the wheel in order to get it, he is sure to win. I gave him the opportunity he asked for because I saw he had made up his mind to stand by until he succeeded. Subsequent events proved that no mistake was made. It could not have been the young man's appearance that got him his start in the Edison office. That was definitely against him. It was what he thought that counted. Barnes did not get his partnership with Edison on his first interview. What he did get was a chance to work in the Edison offices at a very nominal wage. Months went by. Nothing happened to bring nearer the goal that Barnes had set as his definite major purpose. But something important was happening in Barnes' mind. He was constantly intensifying his desire to become the business associate of Edison. Psychologists have correctly said, when one is truly ready for a thing, it puts in its appearance. Barnes was ready for a business association with Edison, and he was determined to remain ready until he got what he was seeking. He did not say to himself, Ah, well, what's the use? I guess I'll change my mind and try for a salesman's job. But he did say, I came here to go into business with Edison, and I'll accomplish my goal if it takes the remainder of my life. He meant it. What a different story people would tell if only they would adopt a definite purpose and stand by that purpose until it had time to become an all-consuming obsession. Maybe young Barnes did not know it at the time, but his bulldog determination and his persistence in focusing on a single desire was destined to mow down all opposition and bring him the opportunity he was seeking. When the opportunity came, it appeared in a different form and from a different direction than Barnes had expected. That is one of the tricks of opportunity. It has a sly habit of slipping in by the back door, and often it comes disguised in the form of misfortune or temporary defeat. Perhaps this is why so many people fail to recognize opportunity. Mr. Edison had just perfected a new device, known at that time as the Edison Dictating Machine. His salesmen were not enthusiastic about the machine. They did not believe it could be sold without great effort. Barnes saw his opportunity. It had crawled in quietly, hidden in a queer-looking machine that interested no one but one but Barnes and the inventor. Barnes knew he could sell the Edison Dictating Machine, and he told Edison so. Edison decided to give him his chance. And Barnes did sell the machine. In fact, he sold it so successfully that Edison gave him a contract to distribute and market it all over the nation. Out of that business association, Barnes made himself rich in money, but he did something infinitely greater. He proved that you really can think and grow rich. How much actual cash that original desire of Barnes was worth to him I have no way of knowing. Perhaps it brought him two or three million dollars. Editor's comment. Three million dollars in the early years of the 20th century would be comparable to more than 50 million dollars in terms of buying power at the beginning of the 21st century. This is the end of the editor's comment. But the amount becomes insignificant compared with the greater asset he acquired the definite knowledge that an intangible impulse of thought can be transmuted into material rewards by the application of known principles. Barnes literally thought himself into a partnership with the great Edison. He thought himself into a fortune. He had nothing to start with except knowing what he wanted and the determination to stand by that desire until he realized it. Three Feet from Gold 
One of the most common causes of failure is the habit of quitting when you're overtaken by temporary defeat. Every person is guilty of this mistake at one time or another. During the gold rush days, an uncle of my friend R.U. Darby was caught by gold fever, and he went west to Colorado to dig and grow rich. He had never heard that more gold has been mined from the thoughts of men than has ever been taken from the earth. He staked a claim and went to work with pick and shovel. After weeks of labor, he was rewarded by the discovery of the shining ore. He needed machinery to bring the ore to the surface. Quietly, he covered up the mine and returned to his home in Williamsburg, Maryland. He told his relatives and a few neighbors about the strike. They got together the money for the machinery and had it shipped. R.U. Darby decided to join his uncle, and they went back to work the mine. The first car of ore was mined and shipped to a smelter. The returns proved they had one of the richest mines in Colorado. A few more cars of that ore would clear their debts. Then would come the big killing in profits. Down went the drills. Up went the hopes of Darby and Uncle. Then something happened. The vein of gold ore disappeared. They had come to the end of the rainbow, and the pot of gold was no longer there. They drilled on, desperately trying to pick up the vein again, all to no avail. Finally, they decided to quit. They sold the machinery to a junk man for a few hundred dollars and took the train back home. The junk man called in a mining engineer to look at the mine and do a little calculating. The engineer advised that the project had failed because the owners were not familiar with fault lines. His calculation showed that the vein would be found just three feet from where the Darby up drilling, and that is exactly where it was found. The junk man took millions of dollars in ore from the mine because he knew enough to seek expert counsel before giving up. Long afterward, Mr. Darby recouped his loss many times over when he made the discovery that desire can be transmuted into gold. The discovery came after he went into the business of selling life insurance. Never forgetting that he lost a huge fortune because he stopped three feet from gold, Darby profited by the experience in his newly chosen field. He simply said to himself, I stopped three feet from gold, but I will never stop because men say no when I ask them to buy insurance. Darby became one of a small group of men who sell over a million dollars in life insurance annually. He owed his stickability to the lesson he learned from his quitability in the gold mining business. Before success comes in anyone's life, that person is sure to meet with much temporary defeat and perhaps some failure. When defeat overtakes a person, the easiest and most logical thing to do is to quit. That is exactly what the majority of people do. More than 500 of the most successful people this country has ever known told me their greatest success came just one step beyond the point at which defeat had overtaken them. Failure is a trickster with a keen sense of irony and cunning. It takes great delight in tripping you just when success is almost within reach.